I'm getting ready today. I'm getting ready today. You're gonna have to cut that out. That's a legality problem. Oh yeah, this whole thing is just gonna be left going. I'm not doing any editing on this. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Thank goodness. It's just gonna be a straight. It's gonna be a straight shot. Oh my god. Well, then we're gonna get sued because I don't have the rights to that song. Do you have the rest of that one? Mm hmm Okay, good. I just wrote it. Alright, I'll leave that one in then. <laughs> okay, thank goodness. What's up, pussycat? Oh my god, <laughs> we're the worst. A little bit. Okay. Alright, here we go. I also don't think we have the rights to that song, do we? I think it's public domain. Is it? Is it? Wait, is I mean, that I how public domain works? Because I know Eat Prince died and his shit was in public domain. Well, yeah, it's because his family owns it. They have to die. We have to kill his family. Okay. And, then we, and then we can use whatever Prince music we want. That's also not going to go over very well either. We can't be just like threatening Prince's family. Alright, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome to uh, the podcast. We haven't thought of a name for it yet. Uh, like Why haven't we thought about that? Why don't we figure this out? Uh, you know, that's just not the way that we go through life. <laughs> uh, okay. You know, the part, part, of, part of creating is uh, not trying to... No, not, not trying to force the creative process to happen. I mean... You know, you just let it happen. I'm sure that while well, one of us is asleep like five days from now, just in a dream, we're, we're going to have a dream about the future, and in that future we'll have, like, this will be a successful podcast, and we'll know the name because we'll hear ourselves say it, and that'll give us the idea to, uh, to name the podcast that thing that you heard in your dream. I mean, well, don't jinx it now. No, I mean, that's a, have you ever had those kinds of dreams? I guess it's deja vu. Yes. That sort of thing. Well, that's what I figure deja vu is. Whenever I hear deja vu, whenever I, like, remember something, I'm like, where the fuck did I remember that? And most of the time, I'm like, oh, yeah, it was in this weird fucking dream that I had. Yeah, and it, I, I started noticing it when I was in, I think, like, middle school, maybe even elementary mm -hmm. school. But it was it was the most mundane things. It was the stupidest yeah. things that I would dream. It would literally be something like, oh, hey, we're driving back from McDonald's. There's no conversation or anything happening, but there's a certain song playing on the radio, and there's that street sign going by, and I'll see it from like the exact same point of view, and it's like that's odd. See, I always saw that, even though it is that, even though it is very mundane, I always saw that as kind of like the universe, the fates, the gods, whatever have you, uh, saying that you're on the right track because you wouldn't have this memory of this thing that's actually happening right now, if if something wasn't telling you that, like, that's where you're going to be. Well, well like, I guess, sure. It's like, hey, you haven't died yet. It's like, oh congratulations, you're still alive. There we go. Thing. By the uh, way, or, I... Or, or is it like a warning thing? It's like, oh, you better make sure this doesn't happen. There we go. Yeah, better make sure you don't drive through McDonald's. Yeah, actually... <laughs> don't, don't drive through McDonald's. Those buildings are, <laughs> those, those buildings are brick. It won't go well. Oh are they brick? I think it depends on the building. And then, yeah. You know what? I'm not the architect, so I wouldn't be I, able to I don't think McDonald's has, like, a, a standard architecture. <laughs> Okay. That they need to, because uh, uh, not all of them play places. I feel like we should say our names <laughs> at some point in time. He's Max. And he's Chris. <laughs> and we are here to talk about whatever the fuck we want to talk about. Well, no. I mean, that's not, no, it's not, it's not a podcast about nothing. It's, uh, this, this, this is a podcast yet to be named uh, about the creative process. I don't want to call it like the, uh, the creative process because I'm sure that's probably already been used and it's also just kind of a lame name. Right. The, the creative podcast. The That sounds really pretentious. Yeah, because, we, I mean, we can be pretentious. There, we don't owe anybody less pretension than we have. We, we, don't, like. owe, we, don't, owe a, we don't owe a single person here post-tense. Um, <laughs> but, no, I mean, the main the main idea that we had for this podcast was, well, Chris kind of had it, and I was just like, yeah, that sounds really good. Well, I mean, really, <laughs> it's really good. Um, um, we, um, no, we, yeah, we were having a conversation... We have because we have a lot of conversations that are just about uh, sort of like the existential side of uh, of being involved in the arts. Well, what we do, what we like, what like why we don't like what we don't like because we don't like a lot of things, and why we do like <laughs> what we do like, um, and the our conversations, no matter what we start off with, always end up being like, well, if only I did this, well, if only I did that, well, if only this project I was working on could get more this, you know what I mean? And so I think what we're trying to do is, A, hold ourselves accountable. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah because uh, one big part of this podcast is going to be talking about like our creative process and like what we're making. Not in like a, oh, we'll let you guys in on this secret, but just kind of like a, hey, have you actually made any progress in, yeah. the, last, in the last month? Or, or have you just been telling people that you're a writer and actually not writing anything and binge watching, I don't know, It's Always Sunny? Like, <laughs> I mean, 
Well, you know what? It's research. <laughs> it's, 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 it's always sunny. Is uh, that that that's art? That is that's art. The, that is uh, that shows all about the that creative. is genius. That shows all about the creative process. Um, but yeah, so I think that's what we're we're essentially trying to do. Once again, hold ourselves accountable. Let you know what we're working on, how we work on it, what goes wrong, what goes right. Um, how to be more efficient at creating. Not yeah. that we are efficient. But just in that, like, trying to discover that... And opening the conversation up to more people, I yeah. guess, is the thing. Uh, we would really like to, if enough people are interested in this, to uh, start taking questions and, uh, and, and discussion points uh, from people listening, just because uh, I think that the larger the conversation is, the more likely we'll get something out of it. Yeah, like, if we say something that we're working on or how we're working on it, and you're like, that doesn't work, that sounds like bullshit, feel, feel free to, to to write it and let us know, or... Yeah, the reason we're doing this is to, is to make sure that all of our ideas get shut down. <laughs> shut up! There's not enough no! Of that. There's not enough of that going around. No, if people have different suggestions of how to go about things, I'm more than open to, to hear about it. I'm not too proud. <laughs> like, I will absolutely try it that way, unless I think it's stupid, and then I won't. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, so a bit about like who we are, what we do. Are we both 25? Are you 25? I think I just did. Yesterday. Yesterday was my 25th birthday. That's right. Happy birthday. Hey. Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, um, <laughs> I earned that. <laughs> Did I remember to tell you that yesterday? I think so. No, you didn't. Out. No, okay. you didn't, but you did ask me how the sex was. And it was great. <laughs> but a little bit about ourselves. We're both 25 years old. We both met at, I keep calling it college, but it was, it was it's a not, it's not. It's not really college. It's a conservatory. It was, we, we, were, we were nuns. And uh, it was that's, an, that's a convent. It was an, yes, that's a convent. Right. It was an acting conservatory. We went to the New York Conservatory for Dramatic Arts. So let's plug that real quick. The training was really wonderful. We, I didn't benefit from the training until like three years after I graduated because I'm a shitty student. But um, we went to the New York Conservatory for Dramatic Arts for acting on film and television. I think that's literally the full name. And we've both We've both had varied paths, like paths since then. Chris has been working on several things more than I have. Um, but I've been working on a couple things and they're really good. Chris, why don't you tell us about <laughs> what you've been working on? Uh, so, you know, like, like you said, like when we came out here, we came out here to be actors. Um, but while I was in, not college, while I was in school, uh, it's kind of like had that realization a couple weeks in of like, wow. I'm surrounded by a lot of people who are really attractive and really talented. Um, I'm not, so I need to think of something. And uh, so my whole thing became like, all right, well, I'm going to learn how to do everything uh, like along with acting. So I started like writing and directing. Is that really it? Because I guess that makes sense. You had like borderline crippling, like, uh, uh, was it? Uh... Um, had. Had. I mean, I get... No, it's gotten better. You're I'm still a cripple. Oh, my God. That's, we can't say that. <laughs> it's 2017. <laughs> no, but, like, like, I... Um, but you, you were... I've, I've gotten a lot better about it. Yeah, you had a lot of self-confidence issues. I mean, didn't we all back then, but no. I... No. 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 I no, not everybody did. You're right. I guess that's fair. I sh we like, did. Yes, we absolutely did. Yeah. But, um... Over the years, we found our, some confidence. You, but you especially, have found a lot of confidence, and I think it has been. I am very different. I feel like I didn't change that much in school, but I changed a lot outside of school. Right. I think I started growing with Shabbat dinner. Honestly. I By the way, I... Shabbat dinner was a short film that Chris London was in. It was the, it was the first film I was ever in. Yes. Uh, and it's the, by far the most successful film I was ever involved it's in. It's so good. It's uh, <laughs> it's yeah, it, it's. From a technical standpoint, you know, it's not that great. This, it, the thing is, it was made on like a really small budget. It was, it, it was, it was Michael's. Uh, it was his application for film school. Like, really? Like, yeah, he 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 made that to try and get into film school. Did he end up getting in? He ended up going like, well, you know what? I, I think I actually don't need to go to film school because I'm really good at what I do. Yeah, because it, because this movie played over fifty festivals and uh, has over twenty two hundred thousand views on YouTube. I don't know anybody else, but we can at least try to plug his name, Michael. Michael Morgenstern. Morgenstern. I almost yeah. said Morgenstein. He's Master. he's doing all kinds of he's he's a really interesting guy. He does all kinds of projects that are just like like he he started working in like three D video now, not three D three hundred sixty degree mm -hmm. video now. Mm -hmm. Like that shit's too daunting it's, for me right it's now. It's insane. But. Like how like what he it, it, the projects that he works on seem so random and so disconnected, but they're all just like really. He's he's, he's they're centered like, around himself. I, I don't know how, I don't know how he does it. But I mean, well, no, no, no. Like they're just like. 
they're, they're all extensions of who he is, I guess. Right. But they, but they so seem they so completely connected. unrelated. Okay, but so, bringing it back to you, you said yeah, that so, that's how you started? That's yeah, how you so started to feel. I, I started... It, it came partially from that, and it also came... It, it came partially from insecurity and just kind of like, I need to uh, have some kind of, like, edge because I'm not going to have it when it comes to, uh, to looks or ability. So I tried to um, write and direct and edit and teach myself how to do all those things so that when I graduated, I had a reel of things that I could show people and go, like, look, here's the work I did. I figured, like, that could be an advantage I would have is, like, look at all the, look at these things I've done. Right. And they weren't great, but it was something. There was one idea where I did, did like, a Woody Allen impression, and I got me, like, a couple student films. Right. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, then I had uh, stuff that, you know, may not have been all that good, but it was shot on, like, actual cameras and, right. not, like, my little flip camera. <laughs> um, and then it just kind of turned into... One of the things that really annoys me is when a project just doesn't get finished. Okay. And so I... Story of my life, but go on. So I, so I, like, started doing every aspect of it so that no matter where it was at, like, no matter where a project was at, I could be pushing it forward. Okay. Was the main thing. So I, I do, like, now I'm, like, producing and yeah. things. And, like, like, I'm producing a project right now. And it's, like, and so I'm doing, like, all the coordinating and all that. This is Sparks in the Park? No, that's, no, okay. no, that's not what I'm writing. I mean, like, I'm producing, like, a shoot that, like, shoots in eight days. Oh, shit. Very uh, nice. So, yeah, like, I'm doing, I do, I do, like, everything now. I have done a total of nothing. I've acted at a couple of things here and there, and I was spoiled in most of my high school and college career in the sense that I never really had to audition for very much. Um, I would audition for maybe one thing, and I would get cast as the lead or a big part or something or another, and then those same people that I worked with would cast me in things and write things for me, and so I just assumed that I was going to skyrocket because people were just going to offer me things, which happened for quite a while after school, but I banged on that too much, and then I wasn't able to do several things, so it got to a point where I just kind of became stagnant and just wasn't doing anything at all. But I would talk a mean game. I would say, oh, I'm a good actor. Oh, I'm a good writer. Oh, I'm a good this. Oh, I'm a good that. Um, until finally I actually sat down and started writing several things. I've begun several short plays and short films, and right now my main focus is a web series based on some scenes that I wrote. The play that I, the web series was based on, it was a play called... a. The difference between alligators and crocodiles, which is this kind of anti-love story between two gay men uh, and how people get away with lying to each other because the other, pe the other person is so delusional that they just want love, that they're willing to do anything for it and look past any sorts of flaws and dangerous red flags to get there. <clears throat> um, and so that's turning into a web series. I've done a couple of readings and the readings have gone extremely well, but that's the extent of my work past... You did Pride. Oh, I did. No, I did do Pride. I was in Pride the series, which is doing really well right now. They're in their second season. Uh, I co-wrote... I started off as a bigger writer, but I ended up being a co-writer for... Uh, and I just have a couple scenes in their new season. Uh... Yeah, yeah, my writing, like, it started off as, like, a grander scale, and then it kind of, like, dwindled down to some of the scenes, but I'm completely okay with that, because the direction that they, the Pride the Series team is going, uh, was not the direction that I felt comfortable going as well, but they're, they're some of the hardest workers I've seen, and every single day, most of the, the head producing team is my roommates, and so every single day, all I hear is pride, pride, pride. They're setting up events. They're contacting soap opera stars. They're contacting producers. They're contacting, like, everybody. And they're making, they have a, a Facebook team. And so they are really fantastic. And I need to kind of learn from them and how to just, like, take an idea that I have. And instead of just saying, like, oh, it's good. I hope someone will listen to it. Just say, like, I'm writing this and I'm putting it up. And someone's going to fucking listen to it because I know that it's great. If you're not backing your project, why would anybody else do it? Absolutely. I guess is the main thing. Yeah. Like if, if, you're not, if you're not behind the work that you're doing, why would anybody else do it? Yeah. And the show, like, like I said, so I've done that show, and that show's been doing really well in many different places. It, uh, it won, like, New Zealand's new, like, 
best new web series, <laughs> which is that's crazy. A, that's, a, that's a really bizarre yeah, and but, extremely specific thing. But who cares? It's like I can put best like, like you know what I mean. Like I can put best web series on my. my design. One of my friends. One of my friends uh, a couple months back he was talking about how he was dating somebody who he, he was he was like oh she's she's really he's like oh she's really hot she's what was it Miss India New Hampshire I mean I'm we like an to, award to be out there we went to school with a girl who was like on the cover of like a uh, Malaysia's Teen Vogue or whatever you know what I mean sure that's, so, that's like, fine and so like it's I I <laughs> never say I believe it. She's stunning. She's still no, listening. That, like, that, that's a different thing though, because it's like Malaysia has its own culture and everything. And so like if she's famous, I feel like in Malaysia, New Zealand has their own culture. New Zealand can have sure, a best original. Like, sure, but Pride isn't isn't New Zealand. Like like they're not from New Zealand. But yeah. So the 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 point being, I haven't I have not done as much outside of school as I would have liked to, or as I would like to. Um, what I have done, I am very proud of. But the hopefully the point of this is to allow my once again hold myself accountable and to maybe even find a way to teach myself to do other things uh, along like the, the way. Getting more like a creative mindset. Yeah, finding it's, out how it's, to it's, be creative. It's, it's such a bizarre thing. Yeah, because it, it, I don't know, it, like it comes in waves, and I know like they say that thing of like if you can't write every day. Like, give it, like, then you should give up on being a writer. See, I'm, like, that, I'm like, that's BS. There are so many successful writers who don't write every day. Okay, A, these, like, these, these slogans are just that. They're slogans, and they're fantastic. And if they work for you, they work for you. But if they don't, they don't. They're not meant to be set-in-stone rules. Adam Rapp wrote Red Light Winter in a single night. And then the, the final draft, he even states that it wasn't that much further from the rough draft because he knew what he wanted to say, and he just wrote it. You know what I mean? Like, sure, yes, write every single day, but at the end of the day, write what you run, want to write and write when you feel inspired to write. Listen, all I'm saying is that if you can't write a complete three-act play every night, you should give up on writing. I mean, okay, I can't stand you. This is also in opposition to many other playwrights and writers as well, whereas like a... Tina there's, there's, there's a Sondheim approach where it's just like, you know, every couple of days just uh, the trip balls and... Uh, Write down whatever comes to mind. Is that really what Sondheim does? I, it's, I, I don't know. Did you just make that up? Because I know, here's the thing. I've heard a it said A lot before. of Sondheim. I've heard, I've heard yeah. it said before. But we also, like, it's also been said that Sondheim has a sex dungeon for twinks. Like, who's to say? <laughs> I mean, twinks probably. There we go. I get, yeah, all the twinks. All the just twinks every, have all. Every twink. <laughs> Sondheim doesn't judge. Just like, if you're a twink, oh like, you're, you're in. Oh, my God. These are, at this, like, I don't know. I just... There's, there's a lot also, of Also, guys, don't assume that I know about anything that I'm talking about. <laughs> no, this is, like a, this is like a really big discussion that I had, like, when I was at NYCDA. Yeah, some, you know, somebody said, like, uh, you know, um, the reason they were, like, trying out all these hard drugs because they wanted to be, like, a, 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 a better artist. I'm just like, that's not... Was it the same guy that came to class drunk because his character was drunk in a scene? No, but I can imagine him saying that. Yeah. But hey, on the bright side, hey, at, least he, at, least, at least he came to class that day. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> oh, yeah, we... Better attendance drunk than sober. I guess that's fair. Uh, anyways, so, uh, moving on from that. I My whole process in writing, my whole th uh, my thought process in writing is I really don't give a fuck if anybody else likes it because I know what I like. I know what I don't like. I know what I view as elevated or... Uh, successful in all aspects of writing, directing, editing, producing, costume designing, lighting designing, all of these things. I know what I find successful. And as long as it meets my standards of success, I am happy. If it doesn't meet anybody else's standards of success, that's completely fine. I'm not worried about it because I didn't make it for you. I made it for me. And I know that I like it because a lot of other people also liked it. So I know somebody's going to like it. So that's been my specific standard for writing. So if 18 people see my shit, then great. 18 people see my shit. And if of those 18, one and a half like my stuff, awesome. And I know that everybody says that, but like, that's genuinely what I feel. I think that's, when it, when it comes to like exposure, when it comes to reaching as many people as you can, because that's like the big thing is, you know, if you want to get your projects funded, a lot of it is showing that you've got reach and showing that it's going to get in front of a lot of people because that's where the money is. I'll or, take a marketing class. You know, like, that. I don't care. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, sure, that's fine. But I mean, like, when it comes to, like, making the 
decisions about what's going to be in this. It even goes down into like the creative aspects. There's a lot of uh, a, a lot of producers, a lot mm -hmm. of studios who are who are very like, okay, well, you should have this thing in because this is what's popular right now. Right. And so it's very much like it doesn't matter if you have nothing to say about it. It doesn't matter if it actually goes against the story. Um, this is what's there's like a checklist oh. of like oh absolutely and that checklist changes every two seconds. So it's just, yeah. I don't know. It's it's, it's frustrating because like it's that thing of like I, I want like I want to be principled. Right. Of, of and course. It, and it feels like it doesn't matter. But do you feel like you have that? I guess luxury when it comes to the work that you write or the stuff that you create. Well, that's the thing. It's it's, it's the thing. Like I guess the main thing is I'm scared of finding success, and then feeling like. I got it by being disingenuous. I guess it's the thing that scares me. Right. Like, like I, I'm genuinely afraid that if I do create something that does well, if I if I feel like I got there by stepping on other people, or by manipulating people or using people, that it's gonna eat at me because I'm, I'm a very guilt-driven person. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I was gonna. <laughs> Kind of uh, point that out. Well, but you've already you've always known that. But yeah, instead of focusing on on all of that, why not find a way to just focus on what you do like and what you do want, what does make you like working on people. Well, that, that, that does make that's, you. That's the struggle, isn't it? I think but, we should talk about like what we're working on right now. Just kind of like the, the the struggles and the successes that we've been having okay. recently. With who it. wants Who wants to go first? Uh, I can go first. Cool. I guess since I brought us into this, <laughs> um, it's only fair. I can just introduce a topic and be like, yeah, hey, you handle it. I don't give a fuck. I'll do it. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I mostly, well, I said earlier, like I'm producing like this thing right now. Um, okay. So should we just focus on just like one major thing that hopefully our audience will want to continue to hear about? Uh, and then see how that yeah, grows. Cause, cause this, yeah. The, the thing I'm producing isn't really interesting. Uh, <laughs> Great. Hear about. Well, because like, cause, like it'll it'll be over like, and it's not really like the creative process part okay. of it. Like it's it's more of the like I'm doing like the like the like the nitty gritty right like, the get the details done sort of thing. It's not really the creative part. Um, well, you know, like I'm, I'm freelance editing and everything now, so I'm trying. I'm always trying to think of like new editing projects. Uh, but I'm mostly like I'm developing like a pilot uh, and two features right now. You I, like to have like eighteen projects going. I, I, I tend to take too many things on at once and uh, have a hard time getting any of them done. Because then, whenever I'm working on something, I feel like I should be working on the other thing instead. Okay, so focus. Let's focus right now on the one thing that you feel would be your top priority of all the six or seven things. I know you're that doing. I know that this month I want to be able to step away from uh, one of the features. Well, I mean, you don't have to. I mean, talk, yeah, I mean, you don't have to talk about it. Yes, we've you discussed it, but you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. Just like, just kind of talk about your process and what's been bothering you, and just know that there so is, is a feature that he's working on. <laughs> this is a feature I'm working on. It's based on probably one of my favorite plays. That's been one of my favorite plays for probably close to ten years, if not ten years now. Mm -hmm. And I never got to do it, um, but I've always kind of wanted to. And a couple of years ago. I talked to the playwright because I, through the wonder of Twitter, I just found him. And uh, I talked to him about the prospect of turning it into a movie, and he was really into it. And it's been a really exciting thing to work on because in a lot of ways this is like a dream project for me. But it's also made it kind of like terrifying. Because uh, then it's like... Because the thing with like film as opposed to plays is with film it's like, all right, you got one chance to do it right. Hmm. You know, like with, 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 the, with the play it's like, the process never really ends because there's always another mm. performance. And so it's like you can always right. learn something in a performance that you apply in the next one. But when it comes to film, like you, you write that and hmm. you make a film once. Unless you're Hollywood, then you make the film 20 times. But yeah, like, you, can, you can honestly do whatever you want. There's, I don't, I don't know, Woody Allen writes the same script and the same play over and over and over and over again. I think, I'm, pretty, all pretty, great, sure, I'm, but pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure the scripts are just uh, emptying out his internal monologue and a piece of paper every night so he can sleep. Great, super. And you know what? And that's what makes him successful. That's what makes him the, 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 what's, I will never be able to pronounce this word, the, the auteur, the auteur. The auteur. Yeah, the auteur that he is. Like... But I don't think I've ever used that word in conversation before. Me either. I've always read it, but <laughs> that's why I was. I, and it's one of those things where, like, I read it, but I never say it out loud, so I just just assume that how I'm saying it is fine. <laughs> but um, 
you know, a big part of it has been adapting it because you know the original play is one act, uh, around sixty pages, takes about an hour on stage, and film moves faster than stage. Uh, so? so what was already there is really probably closer to 45, 50 minutes Great. Of, of a movie. So it's a lot of adding things, which has actually been the easiest part, has been the adding things. The hardest part has been changing the things that were already there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the biggest thing has been accounting for uh, the different climate that we're in now. Because when this play was originally made, it was back in, I think, 89, something mm -hmm. like that. The things that it was okay to make were very different back then, mm -hmm. uh, just in terms of our sensibilities. It, even as recently as 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it was very different. I watched Dodgeball again for the first time oh, in a long time, yeah. a couple, like, couple months ago. They could not make that movie today. Oh, all of the, like, most of the things that we grew up with that we love, that we watch as nostalgia, I can't watch and or reference to people without them going, yeah, 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 that was really funny, but like, it's also really racist. It's also really misogynistic. It's also really this. It's also really that. And you know what? You are absolutely right. It is all of those things. But... <laughs> I am specifically talking about the sensibility of how it made me feel at that point in time and what I'm trying to regain while watching it again. I think a well-executed... Like, I just think you can do that with almost joke. anything. Yeah. I still think a well-executed joke is a well-executed joke. Oh. It's you always know? Sunny Wool is... Yeah. That's the thing. And the here's, exact the, here's the thing that, that really right gets me is like it's, it's still okay when certain people do it or when certain movies do it. This play originally drew a lot of his comedy... Uh, from the fact that this kid was like writing these plays that uh, were really awful and relied entirely on stereotypes of things that he didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of like, oh, I want to set like this spy thriller in India, but he doesn't actually know anything about India. <laughs> and so, But he knows everything about spy thrillers. He knows nothing about that either. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all just really bad is, yeah. is, is like the point. Um, but you know, like part of that includes like, hey, there's somebody with like a stereotypical Indian accent. Mm-hmm. And so it's like this thing of like, okay, is that okay to make anymore? And so it, it's been like a thing that I've been like trying to, to struggle with is like, do I need to take out any of that, like, like all that stuff? Because I also feel like part of the point is like, I don't think that you're supposed to see this and go like, ha, yeah, that's how it is. That's but so you're supposed, politically you're, correct. You're, you're, like... you're supposed to see it and go like, wow, he's terrible. Like, yeah. like this is really bad. It's like, do I have to take that stuff out? Is that like? Is there still, even if we're trying to take the piss out of the fact that somebody would see things this way and like write things this way, and it's more of like you know, it, like well, like where he's like really the butt of the joke because it's like mm -hmm. this is like a, a really sad attempt at right. writing like a culture he doesn't understand. I mean, like, like is that is it still okay to pull humor from there, or is it? I think that's that specifically is going to have to be a personal thing. You just have to decide if that is. If that specific joke, uh, and if that specific, I guess, uh, I guess uh, plot device is something that really tells the story in a way that you want the story to be told, it really helps That's you to understand the character because, and and then just be as clear as possible about that. That's the thing is it, it feels integral to it because like the whole the whole thing is like he's, I feel like wherever you grow up, it, it feels like this generation at least. Uh, wherever you grow up, you hate it. Like, and, and it feels like we all just have this like really big desire to like leave wherever we are and go somewhere else. And I guess it's like, like grass is greener thing, but I feel like it specifically is like this thing of like just being unable to see the good in like the the place that you actually are. Like mm -hmm. you're kind of like numb to that and you just see all the stuff that's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And just like everything that's stupid about it. And uh, so that's like, so he's like constantly... Like, he, he's writing these plays, but he's trying to, like, write all these exotic things that he doesn't know anything about just because he thinks it's so much more interesting than anything that he knows in, like, yeah. his actual life. And so, like, that was, like, the, uh, that's, like, the general point behind it. So I'm, like, I don't know. I feel like if you take out just his sheer, just his complete lack of awareness uh -huh. uh, when, it, when it comes to, um, like, other cultures and everything, then you're taking out one of the biggest parts of his character and his flaws. At the end of the day, it's up to you, but if it's something that you believe is important to the script and to the story, make it as clear as possible. And then if people if people try to combat it, then they will. But at the end of the day, you'll have, you'll understand why and you'll explain why and you, at, at, it's your artistic integrity that you're working with. Yeah, and you like, 
It's, that's it. Like it's it's because like, this is the thing that I've been another question that's been in my mind because of the feature is uh, you know like because of where it's set, which is it's something I want to shoot back home. Um, it is like an all white thing, mm-hmm. and, and it's like a thing where I, I kind of want to write it and kind of talk about like what that experience is, like the thing of like uh, you know like being in an area that really isn't diverse and yeah. being in a place that is all white with all these, with, with like all this like new like awareness and like discussion of racial issues going on, like where they have no idea what that means. Yeah. Because that's, that's the thing is like, you know, I grew up in a place, I think it was, I think the census, it was like 97% Caucasian, something like yeah. that in, in, in my hometown. And it's like, it's just that thing of just like, it just never even comes up. It's, I mean, it, it is sort of an ignorance because it's like, it's so, there's just so much like unawareness of like other cultures and everything because you never, you know, like for example, like if all your information, like if you, if you grew up back there, all of your information, uh, I know all my information about, uh, about Muslims came from the news and came from yep. politicians and came from people on the radio. It came, all of my information about this came entirely from people who weren't Muslim, uh, and we're talking about these people that I had no context for and who I had never met. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I come out here and there's a lot of Muslims here. There's a lot of Mus- There's a lot of everything in, mm-hmm. in, in New York City. Right. There's a lot of everything. And so, like, a, one of the restaurants I worked at, like, half of the uh, half of the kitchen staff was Muslim. And so before the shift, like, they would be on their prayer mats, like, mm-hmm. like down, like, downstairs. And so it just became, like, just became, like, part of my routine. It was just, like, it's, it's just so different, like, to have, like, that, that contact. And so I think that... I, I just kind of want to like talk about it and show like so much of it is so much of it is just there's there's no malice in the ignorance I don't think but so much of it is just in like how would you ever really how do you, under- how do you understand that because that? I, because I feel like we never really talk about that in movies movies yeah. are almost always set in uh, in in New York so the big cities or, yeah they're, they're, or they're like, set they're set in like industrial areas yeah so like they're they're set in, big cities industrial areas or if it is about a small small town it has nothing to do with like racial divides or anything it has everything to do with like when it's in, when it's, whenever it's in a small town it's all about like capturing like the like the southern charm and it's all about right. like oh it's, it's like, oh they're 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 on a farm and they got the accents it, it's it's like that's that's like what it is it, and it's, it's always about somebody trying to leave well, the small town or or, 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 or like they, or like they go to space to try and find like another place for humanity to live. Um, and uh, they wind up like discovering that the fourth dimension is love. So you know, so so I've been like the whole time. I'm just like, is it worse for me to write something that is about being white and not have diversity in the cast, or mm-hmm. is it worse for me to try and write about uh, like this racial perspective with having like diversity in the cast and trying to write for? Okay, but so because because then that's the thing that I would say. Uh, well, here's the thing. I have a I have a friend who, um, whether I agree with her or not, she is very 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 uh, passionate about her opinions, uh, and her experiences. And one of the experiences, and what one of the ways that I've learned to communicate with her is to just sit and listen, and to uh, to accept any and all. Uh, any and all emotions and experiences that come from her as her truth in any way, shape, or form. Whether I specifically agree with her or not is not the point because she is speaking her truth and I have to respect that. And so I try try to do that with everybody, but it's harder for certain people. But she has kind of demanded that and I respect her so much more for that. But one of the things that she gets really upset about is um, the hero syndrome of white people where... um, White people just assume that all black people are, uh, you know, live in impoverished areas. Yeah, and we're, 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 like, every like uh, every black person needs to be saved. And she's like, stop, stop trying to save black people. Black people are fighting for black people. Black people are fighting for the minorities. Black people are fighting for the like. And yes, it is fantastic to have allies. Everybody needs to have allies. However, right. but if you need to have a savior complex, take that savior complex and focus on yourself, because. There's a lot of white people who are saying, I want to save, you know, the minorities. And I think that what you're saying right there could potentially, I don't know how you're planning on executing it and you could completely fuck it up, but I don't, I know you're smart and I don't think you will. But I think that that is kind of a way to, to do that, to just say like, Hey, let's, let us focus on the isolation. Let us focus on 
the manipulation and the the false ideas of and and this uh, this um trained like actually witnessing the trained assumption that all religions and all races uh every single person you meet of these religions and races and cultures is a monolith where you see that person and because you've experienced them on television you know everything there is to know yeah, about where, where it's like if you don't know an individual it's so much harder to realize that people in that group, however you identify them, are individuals. Right. Because it's it's so it's it's so bizarre because you know, everybody talks about like oh this is what the Muslims believe. I'm like you do know that just like with Christianity, Muslims don't all agree. No, that's true, and I think it's I think it is interesting, and I think one of the things that there has been a issue with, um, it, once again in trying to kind of realize that everybody is an individual in that. Uh, Everybody is an individual, but what makes them an individual is also these different aspects of their culture and their race. And I think, yeah, who was it? The who is the lead actress in Fresh Off the Boat? No idea. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it either. But she was in she was in East East Siders East Enders. I'm so sorry if I'm getting the name wrong. Eastbound and Down. No, it was a web series. <laughs> Constance Wu. Constance Wu. Oh yeah, I've heard of it. Spoke uh, spoke out about. Um, I mean, they had a whole bunch of different uh, different people speaking out about uh, uh, cultural uh, identities being represented on television and how a lot of people were uh, because they were afraid of putting on stereotypes they would diminish the culture. Oh, this person who happens to be Asian or who happens to be black or who happens to be Muslim, who happens to be all of these things, just talks like normal people. And that's just like, it's not how people are. If people, if people come from different backgrounds, acknowledge their different backgrounds, but acknowledge how much it, and so it's, it's complicated. And I think we're at a point in time where people like, don't know how to. I think like where we need to get to is, is being able to have black characters and gay characters and Muslim characters and just everything, being able to have them and to deal with issues that affect their lives without that being their lives, without, without it being their only characteristic, without, without it being like... It is so nice to hear you as a straight man say that. Like, <laughs> I cannot tell you how nice that is because that's something that I hear constantly. Because that's, that's one of the things that frustrates me the most. And I, I know you said before, like, you know, and anything is better than any representation is better than nothing. But it, it just it really annoys me when there is like. Well, it's one of those things where it's it's any representation is good a representation until it's not enough. You know, sure. like and so it's yeah. just like at like at a certain point you have to get there. Like for a time for a time in history, all gay characters were either seen as the the sissy or the the effeminate like the effeminate best friend who had no sexuality, who had no storyline, was literally just there for comedic relief to be effeminate and to be the hairstylist or the makeup artist or, or the this or the that or, or the villain. Or, or they'd have the one off where they're actually really masculine, but that would be played off for laughs. And be right. like, oh, but they're gay? Oh, who the fuck it? Yeah, and there's just, or, or they play the villain, where the villain is always, like, almost every single Disney villain is extremely a male Disney villain is extremely effeminately That's so gay. so bizarre. I've been, trying, not, I, I've, been I've been trying to train people to think that homosexuality is evil, but... Well, sure, but, but here's the thing. Is like, it's, right. it's, it's not just like in, in our culture, though. It's like it's also uh, uh, Japanese. One of the things that you'll see, like if you if you do play Zelda's, which I know you're going to play Zelda at some point because that's one of the things you're planning. Uh, spoilers. Um, is that a lot of their villains, not yet, not like the main series villain, but like a lot of their side villains are very effeminate. And that's something that's actually like a trait in a lot of Japanese video games is they have like very effeminate right. uh, uh, villains. And, and it's just kind of like, where did this right. come from? And so, well, yes, at a certain point in time in history, it is good to have representation because without that representation, people wouldn't know that different kinds of people exist. However, at a certain point, you have to take it to the next step. Otherwise, the representation think, becomes harmful. Yes. Yeah. And so I think that's what we're trying to get to. I think that's what all of this, this craziness is coming from. And I think what it all should boil down to is... Write what you know. That's why I thought Moonlight was so fucking brilliant, though. Moonlight was Moonlight was just beautiful. Like, so like, I, I, thought, I, thought it, I thought it was brilliant because I was just like it dealt with these issues, but like that wasn't all it was. It's like yeah, like he dealt with being black and and like what that means and everything, but that wasn't his entire struggle. And he also like dealt with things that everybody deals with because he's also human, like everybody else. Mm -hmm. 
And so he deals with things that aren't just defined by his race. And it, it dealt with, like, oh, God, it felt like it dealt with everything. I, that was like, that was one of the best things I've seen in theaters. I think the time. last, oh, that last, I, like, I don't think it spoils anything, but, like, literally the very last breath that the lead actor takes in the final scene is one of the most, like, hopeful and heartbreaking and just, like, glorious scenes, that I've, or just glorious acts I've seen in any movie. Um, but yes. That, that movie made me excited to see movies again. Like, I... Because for a long time I've been kind of bored with them. See, I figured and you would have liked seeing it as, from, like, a, as an editor, or, like, from an editing point of view. Oh, the editing, the editing was... The, the editing was... Fucking no, epic. The editing was insane. The, the aesthetics is all... There's nothing about that movie that I think was done bad. Like, that, that is one of the only movies where I think, like... The color scheme was genius. I thought, so I, thought, like, I thought the framing in the last shot was weird. That was the only thing... That was literally the only thing oh, I could think interesting. of. Interesting, okay. That was like the only thing was I just thought it was kind of a weird shot. Okay. But like that was literally the only thing that I could even think of to nitpick in that movie. Also, was, Janelle <laughs> Monet is a fantastic actress. She is. <laughs> like, she, she, she is phenomenal. Oh no, it's just it was confusing because it was just like I was watching it and I've been a fan of Janelle Monet, but I didn't know she could act. All I know is that this like <laughs> stunning woman comes on screen and I was like Oh my god. I have to know her name. No, I was like, this beautiful woman looks like Janelle Monet, but that can't be right. Janelle Monet is not an actress, so I'm just racist. And then I looked it up and I was like, oh my god, I'm not. Thank god. It's watch, actually Janelle Monet. You could just watch the credits. I couldn't. I had to figure it out right then and there. Like, she came in at such a beginning of the movie. That's at fair. such an early point in the movie. Um, Anyways. So, yeah. so that's, that's the thing I've been dealing with is like, is like with that, and it's like, it's been something that's been on my mind for a while. Like, when I, when yeah. I wrote that Static Shock thing, there was, there was this contest to reboot a franchise uh, to, to write like a like a like a screenplay, and so I wanted to reboot Static Shock, um, because it's a show that I had missed a lot from my childhood that hasn't been rebooted, um, and with all the other superhero stuff going on, like I felt like it'd be, be cool. it'd be cool to have that one back because mm -hmm. like, it was it was like the Hey Arnold of superheroes. I think that was the thing. It that, was, like, yeah, it was fun. Like that was the thing that like really appealed to me about it. It was it was fun, but it also like treated kids like they could actually handle actual issues mm -hmm. and and like i love that it was ah, it, it was a really good show and like everybody that i've ever talked to who grew up like around the same time i did loved that show it, it was such a good show and so you know i wanted to reboot it and uh put it like in like today's world and everything and it's just a thing of, like okay but i don't know if i'm allowed to write this it's, it's like i don't know if i'm allowed to do this right. and so what followed was then trying to get uh, well, I, I talked a lot to some of my friends who are, uh, who, who are black and also writers or just creators. And I just talked to them and was like, is this something I just shouldn't even touch? Like, like hmm. is this, is this just... And what was the general consensus? Go for it. Like, like I, I, I was told to go for it as long as like, and, and they were, I don't know. It was, I, I tried to, what I tried to do was I, tr I tried to not be the person to write it was the thing. I, okay. I, I tried to get... Some of my friends to be excited about writing it as well. Right. Well, the thing well, they, they 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 wanted to, but they were all really busy. Right. And so what it became was bouncing ideas off them, and then writing it and sending it to them and getting notes. Okay. Well, and I mean, maybe I mean you don't have to worry about it again. But okay, my main thing about all of this is is making sure you write what you know, and write only the truth. Yeah. Like that's that's just it. I just, I had I had a thing where these. Uh, I try to make sure that all of my characters in all of my plays don't have any sort of specific uh, racial guidelines. Um, that way, they can be portrayed by anybody, and they can add any kind of any kind of personality that they need to, any kind of personal traits that they have that they need to. And then, as a writer, I always believe that the words are the least important aspect of a script, like. Words are one of the worst forms of communication that we have. That's, like, all, that's all I know, though. Huh? That's all I know. No, it's not. It is not all you know. It's all. <laughs> it's all people have been trained to know. Like, I'm sorry. If words were the if words were the best form of communication that we had, we would not be able to lie. So I would be more than willing to work with people and and saying this isn't right, this isn't correct, this is and change things and work things and move things around. Um, which I'm trying to figure out if that's the right way to do or not. But I was talking to, I was talking to a friend. And I said, hey, I have this play. It's a two-man play. And um, I've been thinking, like, every single time I have an actor in mind, the actor happens to be white. 
And that's fine. These are very talented actors, and assuming they don't want to be a part of it at all, um, you know, I would be I would be very honored. But I also don't want it to just be another thing about you know, like oh look at these gay white men going about like because that's 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 also a thing in the gay the gay culture the gay community where like everything that is praised and celebrated in the gay community is uh, about like in shape gay white men. Um, and that's something that needs to change, but it's also something that can't just change because it, it, I, I can't just be like, oh, let's just use affirmative action on this thing and just like yeah. get the, give him, give this person, the, give this part to a person of color just because I want to give to this, give this part to a person of color. I just have to make sure that I cast who needs to be cast because they are right for the role. Not because they have the right skin tone, not because they have more or less melanin, but literally because they are entirely right for this role and what kind of story I want to tell or what kind of story needs to be told. And I think by opening up, by opening up the doors of, of, of race and just allowing anyone and everyone to, to be a part of it, I give myself more options to, to find that person because I still haven't even gone through the audition process. I know that I have friends in mind that I'm like, they would be good. They would be good. I've seen them act. I've seen them act. I know that they would be good. I know that they would be great. Um, but one of, one, one of the things that she just drilled into me was just make sure that you're being honest. Just make sure that what is said needs to be said. What is written needs to be written. What is done needs to be done. Don't just write a black character because you want a black character. That's, don't, don't, that's don't just, just, to, just write it to Yeah, that's just, that's, yeah, and I don't want to be that. That's, that's, and I'm also just trying to acknowledge that I'm, I'm, I'm still an ignorant person who's not fully aware of of all of the differences and what is offensive and what is not offensive and what, like, I'm still trying to figure that out. And I'm willing to say I fucked up. If, you know, people tell me that this is fucked up, you know what I mean? Um, but that's just my goal. My goal is to be as honest as possible, um, tell the truth, and hopefully things will fall into place the way they need to be in place. And I'm not going to try to, to, to be delusional enough to say that, like, I'm going to be right and I'm going to be fair and I'm going to be perfect every time. But damn it if I'm not going to try. You know, right. and I think that's all that we can really do. It's hard because it seems like no matter what you do, like there's always a way that it can be interpreted, and it just gets so in my own head about my about my motivations and about uh, about why I'm doing things and whether it's actually out of uh, a desire to make things better for marginalized people or if it's about assuaging yeah. myself. You know, and I think I think that's a good place to be at least trying to figure that out. I once. And I'm, I'm gonna say know. this. I'm gonna say this ad nauseum, and I'm so sorry, but just like, no one thing is a monolith. Like you, yeah. like allies. Yeah, like, definitely. No, they're, they're they're allies who are allies are so many different things. There's so, it's once I can the only thing that I can really speak to, um, in my personal experience is for the gay community. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, and and allies are a big part of the gay community, and allies are are definitely something that is very, very important, but there are a lot of people who misconstrue what ally means. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's just yeah. like, there are a lot of, a lot of straight women who go to gay bars as like, uh, for their, for their, uh, bachelorette parties or whatever and they think oh because they have gay friends because they you know are like befriend their gay friends that they can go to these gay clubs and just like steal the scene and make it about them and make it like be loud and be drunk where it's just like that's not the point of a gay bar that's and so it's just like and, and so it's it's very different whereas I have many 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 a straight woman friend who will actively sit and listen and hear some of the things that I have gone through, hear some of the things that my friends have gone through, hear some of the things that my community has gone through, and say, that hurts me. That makes me angry because I love you, and I'm going to fight for you, and I want to know the best way to do that. And yeah. so there are there, and so they, like, I have straight women friends who go to protests. I have straight women friends. Yeah, who, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, they're genuinely, good, <laughs> they're, they're, they're genuinely good people. I mean, I'm not saying that, like, it just it just really annoys me, I guess, when I see somebody who uh, likes to plaster their social media with descriptions of all the causes uh -huh. that that they're for, and all these descriptors of like who they are as like these activists, and it's like okay, but I know you in life, 
and you don't actually really right. do anything for these people. But you really but like letting you, you well, really like letting people know that. And it's like it's like and I, I don't know. So I guess I guess it just feels well, you're not in charge of anybody else's. You're not in charge of anybody else's life. You're not yeah. in charge of it, how anybody else lives their life. Um, for whatever these people who do these things, there's something inside of them that makes them feel good, sure. that gives them satisfaction by saying, "I am a good person." A, first of all, none of us are good people. None of us are good people, and none of us have even like, and, and none of us deserve to tell ourselves that we're good people. All of us inherently have shittiness inside of us. That's just a thing. We're just all shit people. But because we don't like to think of ourselves like that, because we like to believe that we are the heroes in our story and everybody else's story, we're constantly going to say, I'm good because I did this. I'm good because I did that. And so, yes, there are a lot of self-serving people. But unfortunately, you're not a self-serving person. You like to think the worst of yourself. And so because you like to think the worst of yourself, <laughs> like it's true, because you like to think the worst of yourself, you get hesitant on trying to like think better of, or trying to like stand up for someone else um, and say, oh, I did it and claim that and claim that as your own. And if that's if that's not what you want to do, then don't do that. You don't have to you don't have to say like I did this wonderful thing because I'm a wonderful person. You just have to know that you did this wonderful thing because it needed to be done. Because something inside of you said I cannot stand by without doing this thing. And this is the only way that I know how to do this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I guess it's the thing is like I I guess I really want to be the person who focuses more well, I guess I should say, who focuses less on telling people who and what I am and more on just doing what I think I should do and letting other people decide, like, mm -hmm. what describes me. I mean, you don't even have to let... I mean, you can let other people describe that, but at the end of the day, you don't have to do that as well. You just have to do what you need to sure. show. Well, I mean, they're... They will anyways. Exactly. Like, that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's like, I want to be less preoccupied with trying to control the, like, the, way, that they, the way that they see me. I yeah. guess is the thing. Because that's... And I, I think it's something we all deal with. I think like, that, but I think that's a good goal for you to have. Like, for me, I can, I can only I can only attribute it to my, like, the, the pettiness of my, like, writing and acting. Like, in acting, I give a shit whether people like me or not. Yeah. I, like, I get nervous, I get shaky, I get, like, I get... I go into borderline, like, breakdowns. Is it because you're doing other people's, uh, like, work? Yeah. Like other people's words? Yeah. So do, but do when have I have it? my own work, whenever I do my own words, whenever I know exactly what I am trying to say, and I know exactly what I want, I don't give a shit whether you agree with me or not. It's like, really funny. I've got it. It's, like, really, it's really funny because I'm, like, the opposite. Yeah. It, it's, it's way easier for me to, uh, to let go and trust myself when I'm doing other people's work. If I'm, like, if it's something that I've written, I get so nervous mm -hmm. that, like, uh that like it, it won't come out right that i'm like really hesitant to put myself in like stuff that i've written because uh -huh, I, I, I want i want to be like watching it the entire time and i want to be like how oh, interesting okay yeah See, I, I'm, like, I'm like the exact opposite i'm that i'm that kind of vain egotistical person that like i write for me like i'm i'm a very specific type a lot of people like okay we also should probably wrap up here pretty soon but uh oh i'll edit it down <laughs> but um uh i'm for those of you who don't know what I look like, uh, I am a, a decent-sized individual. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> no. He's, he's Jason Ritter. I'm Jason Ritter plus, like, f five inches in height and, like, uh, 60, 70, 80 pounds of weight. Like, <laughs> I'm, a relatively, I'm a relatively big guy, and it's hard to place me because I'm not, I'm not big enough to be considered, like, the character, like the the yeah, overweight character actor, because because there's that thing, right? Yeah. With men, it's like you're either like incredibly trim and fit, or you're or, like or incredibly you're, or you're overweight. Like a big guy. And you can have great careers either way. It's it's not but, as limited as as it is with women. Yeah, it's like there are plenty of like very overweight men that have like huge right. careers. I'm not one of those. I have like I I have. I have You're still very and, attractive. Oh, trust me, I know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think I look great, but I'm also fully aware that I do not look the way that most men in this industry look. Um, even though yeah. I do claim, even though I do claim my uh, Hispanic heritage, I do not look it at all. 
Like you can see it a bit in the eyes, and it's basically it. Yeah, sure. And then my beard comes in really nice, like. <laughs> yeah. But like. But it's brown and light. It's, yeah, so it's brown. Like, and then like there's like hints of red because I'm also Irish. Like that's just a thing. So like I I'm I'm a very very white man who, if people don't know what I look like when they see the name Martinez, they get up in arms. Um, but I'm I I'm you a white. like one of the most like posh white British first first names, names ever. and then like yeah, it's Maxwell, Maxwell Martinez. <laughs> Maxwell Martinez. <laughs> yes. But yeah, and so because of my bizarre name and because of, which is not a bizarre name, it's actually a star name. Like, come on. Maxwell Martinez is a great name. Nobody else has this name and it rolls off the tongue beautifully. But... (laughs) They wouldn't call you Eminem? Like... Oh God, no. Nothing like like that. Like all the the gossip rags. Um, But yeah, so, and I'm a, like I said, I'm a heavier set guy. Uh, I'm an attractive guy. Um, and it's hard to place me in, in scripts. The roles that I want to play are never going to be the roles that I will play. Because those roles, for whatever reason, even though it doesn't say anything in the script about it, will always be played by skinny white men. And that is fine. But because I have this dilemma, I have decided to write for myself. I know the roles that I want to play. I know what I want to see performed. I want And I want to know what stories need to be told from my perspective. And so... I write those, and I don't write them and say, okay, guys, have fun, go play with this. Like, no, I wrote this, and some other people can perform in them with me, but I wrote them for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> Chris read the stage directions for my latest, like, short play. Yeah. And, like... It's a really challenging character to take on. Like, it was literally me. I, <laughs> it was, it was I, wrote, I wrote just, like, the worst and borderline the best of me as two completely separate characters that just kind of, like... Yeah. Went at each other and like fucked all the time. God, this sounds terrible. No, it's a really good piece. I promise you guys. He's in, he's in a lot of weird shit. <laughs> how do you figure? How, how do I figure? Well, I've lived with you quite a lot. Uh, I've known yeah. you for even longer. Yeah, but I thought we were just talking solely on the script. But yeah. Oh, based on the scripts. Yeah, just me. I, I mean, just... even when it comes to scripts, you're into some really abstract, weird stuff. But you're talking about the ones that I write, yeah? Or no? Just the stuff. The that ones I you write, and then also the stuff that you read. Oh, I'll just like, read anything. Crave. Crave is amazing. You're I need really to be, into Crave. I really need to be. I still I need to do it. it. I still need to. Okay, I just reread it like two weeks ago. And here's the thing. I didn't understand it the first time I read it either. But now I feel like I completely get it. Which I don't completely get it. But there's like so much more that I just like viscerally understood. I need to do it. I need to be a part of that play in some way, shape, or form. Anyways, I will read anything and everything because I want to know what is out there, what are the rules, what people are getting away with, and what I can get away with. I'll do whatever I want to do because it's my world, (laughs) like it's, these are my scripts, but I would never know that I would be able to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know that I would be able to write things uh, that kind of can seem like stream of consciousness and have it be acceptable and have it be praised. I didn't know that I could write characters and stories that are interacting between time and space in, in, with using nothing but like a stage direction to state that. Sarah Rule, uh, is a playwright who, who writes some of the most beautiful poetic stage directions. And one of my favorite stage directions she writes is, they fall in love. As a stage direction, they fall in love. That means the lighting director has to know exactly what that looks physically. That means the, the, the costumer has to know what that looks like. That means the director has to know exactly what image he wants them to be, want, wants these characters to be in. That means the actors have to know exactly what love means to them and have to know how to physically convey that. As a stage direction, that's fucking genius. And I would never know that I was allowed to have a stage direction beyond you know, Linda exits stage left, like, Pursued you know? Pursued by bear. Pursued by bear. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. You should, you should so, write that. You should, you need to have a stage direction that says Pursued by bear, and it's just like a big hairy shirtless guy. I'll do it. <laughs> Excellent. We'll get John Mark. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Is, is, he, is he a bear? No, he is an otter. He's an otter. Okay. Is it because he's like so he's skinnier? Slim? It's yeah. skinnier. Okay. Yeah, otters. There's so skinnier. much terminology. Not really. I know you're pretend to... Straight people love to act like the gay community terminology is all that big. It's not. Just it's just all of God's woodland creatures. It's 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 it's, it's just it's just compared compared to like our terminology. 
which is so maybe it's just because that's just what we grew up with. It's just so boring. I don't know. Oh yeah, straight people are totally boring. <laughs> yeah, we're bland. <laughs> hey, that's stories for a long time. We just need to stop writing straight people. Thank you. It's been there. Yeah. I've done that. <laughs> this is kind of who we are. This is kind of where our conversations usually lead. This is our, yeah, that's the thing. Is like we didn't really have an outline for this one. Yeah. Uh, this is just what we do when we talk. Yeah. This is just where we go, and it it bounces from topic to topic, uh, and it's. It seems like it's leading nowhere, but at the end of the day, I think it informs both of us and who we are and how we write. Um, I definitely, I definitely love hearing about what Chris writes and how he writes, um, and I find it impressive uh, and try to see how uh, how he prioritizes the story that he's telling. My priority in storytelling is almost always entirely in the dialogue. At the end of the day, I prioritize dialogue over to, to kind of lead into where these characters go, whereas I've seen Chris fully structure pieces and say, okay, now I don't know what they're going to say. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's... I mean, Back to One was the first time that I, like, really took on something that size. And it was, like, plotting out, like, ten episodes and just having, like, an arc for every character. Yeah. It was, like, an ensemble piece with 11 people. And just how all these things are intertwined. It's like, okay, these people need to have a scene for this. And then uh -huh. it was just like jumping around like, I'm going to write this person's scene now. Yeah. And then like when it comes to actually writing it, though, I do sink way too much into dialogue. And I'm terrible at writing action. Um, which is what I'm trying to work on. That's fair. I, I wouldn't say that, but that's fair. Uh, it's with, Well, with, for film and television, yeah. I, I mean, well, I wouldn't know, but I would say probably as a playwriter... I mainly focus on letting it's, the dialogue it's, it's, in. It's easier in plays. Yeah, it's so much easier in plays. Maybe that's why I do it. <laughs> like, yeah, like like writing plays, like you, yeah, you can write something that's mostly dialogue, and there's some stage direction. But for the most part, it's like oh, they block it all out later. With film, it's like no, no, you gotta block it all out. Yeah. Before like before anybody reads it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's certain like I just saw a Warner Herzog movie where I read it like and I hated it, but it was hailed as one of the like greatest movies ever made, <laughs> and uh, I read afterwards in an interview that he didn't know what the characters were going to say five minutes before the shoot and that well, pisses me off more than anything there's it's like it's, it's an approach though and it works that's the thing, it's, like, it is an approach and it's people, just not an approach that i would ever be satisfied with there are so many different ways to make a movie yeah it's fascinating yeah at the end of the day, that's kind of, like, once again, this is kind of where we go. This is kind of what we do. We, we, always... so we started wrapping it up and just went off on Yeah, so now we're actually going to wrap it up. Let's, 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 <laughs> let's set goals for the next month. Like, what are we okay. going to do by the next month? <sighs> okay. Um, by next month, I will have at least, oh, fuck, at least two more episodes written in my web series. Okay. How does that sound? And then that's we can good. discuss, like, what that process is or whatever. That's I don't good. know. It's a ten, yeah, it's a ten episode web series, and I only have two episodes written right now. So two more. By the, next, by the next episode, uh, I want to. Well, I want to have finished Sparks and put it behind me, and just okay. been like this is where it sits until okay. it actually goes in production. Okay. Um, so that I can start uh, this pilot that I've been wanting to do for a long time that I've been developing, but I'm telling myself I can't write it until I put away Sparks. Great. <laughs> I'm trying to like force myself to prioritize. But all my all my ideas are coming in for the for the pilot right now, so that's unfortunate. Um, well, then maybe focus on that. Because I I how about both? I want to finish both of them. No, absolutely finish both of them, but listen to what's coming to you first. Like, don't force yourself to work on something that you're not as passionate about in this specific moment. I'm so passionate some, on it. No, of it's, course, but instead of getting into these moral quandaries about it, and then I just sit there agonizing over it, I need to stop doing that. That, right. that that's my goal is to stop judging my motives and just right and let other people judge it uh, it's, it's really hot in here the nice thing is by the next episode i will have an air conditioner in here it's literally here in two days we should have just waited two days we should have then just again we could have also just recorded this two weeks ago like we initially planned that's fair wrapping up uh yeah let us know what you thought about this um let us know if you have any questions let us know what you want to hear let us know uh if like if, if you have any questions that you want us to talk like any discussion topics that you want us to talk about if you uh if anything that we said, if you want to have a conversation about it, put a comment down below and we'll probably respond. Um, I know I'll be watching the comments. I usually do. I need the validation. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I just want to make this, like, an open dialogue, and I want to make it an audience-involved thing. Yeah, and then... And maybe we'll have guests on, too. 
starting with the next episode, we're going to actually be structuring it out and going like, these are our topics, uh, and having like a time thing. But this one, I really just wanted to give you a taste of who we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's basically it. Let's call this podcast The Taste. <laughs> that sounds so gross. Yeah? We're not going to do that. I don't think we're going to do that. We might do that. Yeah, we're going to do that. I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> we always do. All right. Well, uh, bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yes, thank you.